You are listening to the number one fitness, health, and entertainment podcast. This is Mind Pump. You made it. Now, in today's episode, we answer fitness and health questions that are asked by our audience and listeners just like you. But the way we open the episode is with current events, uh, fun conversation. We mention our sponsors. Today's intro portion was 38 minutes. After that, we got into the fitness questions. I'm going to give you a rundown of today's entire episode. We open up by talking about my incredibly deep sleep last night due to a product called Ned Sleep. This stuff is powerful, ladies and gentlemen. Mm. Try it out one time. You'll sleep like sleep a dead. like a log. It's very effective. And because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a massive discount. By the way, it's, uh, it's hemp oil extract high in CBN and other botanical compounds that help you sleep hard. Um, and again, you get a discount because you listen to Mind Pump. Go check them out. Go to helloned.com. That's H-E-L-L-O-N-E-D.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump and get 15% off your first purchase. Then we talk about Grandma Schaefer. This is uh, Adam's mom and her relationship to her grandchildren and Adam's relationship to that whole situation, which is interesting. Uh, then we talk about Adam's use of Z-Biotics and how his family has stolen all the Mind Pump Z-Biotics as they mm. like to drink alcohol. They can get down. Z-Biotics is a genetically modified bacteria. Okay, It's patented. You drink it right before you drink alcohol. The bacteria breaks down the compounds, uh, the negative compounds that happen from drinking alcohol. So if you feel like shit the day after you drink alcohol, try Z-Biotics and see how you feel. I tried it, and the next day I feel like uh, I didn't drink. It's phenomenal. Um, and again, because you listen to Mind Pump, you get a discount. Go check them out. Go to zbiotics.com. That's Z B I O T I C S.com forward slash Mind Pump. Use the code Mind Pump, get 10% off All your the first party, none of the pain. Order. Then we talk about Jake Paul and how uh, he called out Connor McGregor. These YouTube stars are fighting all the best fighters. It's. Uh, I mean, and, they've earned it. And Adam was right about that. He called it a little while ago. Yeah. So he was right one time. Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> then we confirmed. We talked about the time John Stossel called out a pro wrestler, told him wrestling was fake, and lost his hearing. And then we watched the video, and it was great. As a result, uh, we talk about Bruce Buffer uh, helping someone break up with their girlfriend. Uh, <laughs> we bring up Pornhub and how uh, Visa and MasterCard will no longer be working with Pornhub. So all you guys out there and girls who pay for porn, which is weird, uh, you're going to have to use Bitcoin now, apparently. I'm sorry, Mom. We keep bringing up porn. Then I talked about <laughs> aspirin fish, and fish oil and how those can maybe help with severe symptoms or prevent severe symptoms from COVID. There's some interesting studies on this stuff. Go check it out. Then we talk about how dogs are being trained to smell COVID. I wonder what that yeah. smells like. Uh, bat, Wait till they smell me. Smells like bat soup. Uh, and then I talked about a podcast uh, that I really enjoyed with Bishop Barron and Ru and Ruben, Dave Ruben. Excellent podcast called Word on Fire. Go check it out. Then we got into answering the questions. Here's the first one. This person wants to know if there's an ideal rest period between sets. So we talk about rest periods, why they're important, and what the ideal rest periods are. The next question, this person wants to know what we recommend as far as working out post-pregnancy, uh, so postnatal. Uh, the next question, what exercises we recommend to help with knee pain? So we talk about, all about knee pain and how to help yourself with that. And then the final question, this person sounds like they're a personal trainer, wants to know what you consider, how you consider yourself successful if you're, if you're a trainer. So like, what does that mean? Is it with your clients getting good results? Is it selling a lot of training? Is it the money? What's the deal with all of that? Now, also this month, we've put together three workout bundles for three different types of people. So a workout bundle is where we take multiple MAPS workout programs and combine them uh, for different goals. Um, each one of the bundles I'm about to go over will give you about nine months of exercise programming. So that means that you'll have your workouts all planned out for you for nine months. And there's instructional videos and pictures and the whole deal. It takes out all the guesswork. So here's the three bundles. The first one is called the new to weightlifting bundle. This is excellent for beginners. The second one is the Body Transformation Bundle. This is amazing for intermediate lifters. And then we have an advanced bundle for those of you that have been working out for a long time. It's called the New Year Extreme Intensity Bundle. By the way, all of these come with one-year access uh, to the private forum. Now, the reason why this is uh, amazing is because the forum allows – it gives you uh, access to a group of people. It's about 3,000 people in there. Uh, where you can ask questions about fitness, nutrition. You can share funny memes. It's a mm. great place to do that. Built-in accountability. Uh, and then Adam, uh, Justin, and myself visit there uh, occasionally as well. So that is included with every one of these bundles. Go check them out. See which one works for you. By the way, they all come with a 30-day trial. So if you sign up for a bundle, you follow it for 30 days, it doesn't blow your mind, you can return it for a full refund. 
You can find out more at mapsdecember.com. Again, that's maps, M A P S, December.com. And it's t shirt time. Ah, shit, Doug. You know it's my favorite time of the week. Oh, yes, it is. Yeah. Wow. You guys need to step up your review game here. We only have two winners this week. Oh. We have for Apple Podcasts, super awesome person. Mm hmm. And for Facebook, Kem, sorry, Ken KM. Both of you are winners. Send the name I just read to iTunes at mindpumpmedia.com. Include your shirt size and your shipping address, and we'll get that shirt right out it's to you. It's super easy to leave a review. You can go on iTunes, leave a review, uh, or you can go on Facebook under Mind Pump, leave a review. It's got to be a good review. We pick the best ones. You win a free shirt. It's super easy to win a shirt. Go do it right now. Dude, I, uh, I, I haven't used the Ned Sleep in a while because yeah. I ran out. Because uh, Who was it that took them all? Was that you, it Justin? That was me. 100%, dude. Fucker. It, it's the only, dude, listen, you steal everything. So, yeah, it, you true. know, this is the one thing I got ahead of you on yeah, this one. Yeah, nine out of ten supplements I'll take. Yeah. You'll take the Ned Sleep. And then what does yeah. Adam steal all the time? I don't steal anything anymore. Yeah, you do. I just, just have it shipped straight to my house. That's what I yeah. do. <laughs> Asshole. I That's run all true. the partnerships. I'm just like, yeah, send that He's one like, to uh, 3035. No, you get the barbecue. That's <laughs> yeah, you got. you get the trigger girl. You got like, the, oh, I'll, I'll take the $50,000 barbecue. Yeah, exactly. You I guys just, can have a little supplement. No, man. dude, I hadn't used it in a long time. I used it last night. Oh, my God, dude. You sleep like you're dead. Yeah. yeah. Like, out, out. I took it and I, I woke up uh, without waking up at all throughout the whole night. I felt yeah. like I felt like I did like a fast forward or something. It's it was like crazy. Yeah, you, you just hibernate it. It yeah. should be nominated for like one of the products of the year. You know that right now that's going on, right? They start doing all those products of the year and stuff. It should be up there. Oh in my yeah, opinion. Yeah, yeah. yeah, for sure. We should oh. submit something for. Oh, them. you know what I want to bring up Adam. No, um, they killed it. I so you posted in your story a picture, a video of it looked like your mom. Yeah. With her grandkids. Yeah, yeah. And she's playing with them and doing all that kind of stuff. And I was watching it. got me emotional um, because, I, you know, I know your history growing up and all that stuff. And now you see your mom with your kid and other kids. Is is that change like is is your mom a different grandma than she was as a mom? Is oh, it changing okay. how you viewed things? Because I know it, it kind of does that yeah. did that for me a Ch little bit. Changed for me, yeah. I'm sure. Oh yeah, no, she's uh, you know, I so I guess the the thing that was so this the, we just celebrated our Christmas, right? The post you're talking about was on uh, my private page. That's Max's page. Oh, that's it. Okay. Yeah. So people listening didn't see it. So it was just a video of my mom. Uh, she was, I think she was like, she looked like she was reading or something. No, she was there showing. She was showing him a video on online, right? And okay. so she had got all of her grandkids uh, around, sitting in her lap and around her, and 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 watching the videos. So yeah, you know, the thing that's been really interesting to watch for like my sister, my sisters, and I <clears throat> is. You know, we didn't, as uh, I've shared before, our Christmases weren't the greatest, right? Mm -hmm. So I've talked about that. And my mom's in a really good place now. I mean, she's got a great job. She's she's married to somebody who's done well for himself. And so my mom's in a different position financially. And then now she's a grandma. And so, like, she goes over the top, spoils, like, the kids for, for holidays. And mm -hmm. so it's really interesting for all of I mean, I, I heard my sister, like, throw a jab under her breath. Like, you know, there's like, oh, wow, it's nice that uh, you guys have a nice Christmas, right? Like, to the kids, right? So, <laughs> yeah. um, so it's – but I, I, I'm really enjoying it. It's, it's actually really nice. I think it's calm. My mom's super calm. She was not like that when we were kids. When we were kids, it was – our house was never calm. Um, she's got uh, – I feel like she has so much more patience – um, you know, and, and I, I was taught, we were talking about it this weekend, just saying like, what's we are asking her, you know, what's it like being grandma now, you know? And she's like, it's the most amazing thing ever. She goes, you, you get to, it feels like you get to relive having a child again because it's, it's part of your bloodline. Mm -hmm. Um, but then you get to give it back for all the hard shit, you know, so you don't have to stay up late on the nights or if crying and fussing. You ain't going to do anything. Plus you're more wise, you know, yeah. you're not going to stress out as much. <clears throat> Are Is your relationship changing now with your mom because of that? Do you find yourself like seeing her differently? Or? Yeah. I mean, I would say that my mom and I did a lot of work uh, in my late 20s, uh, early 30s. So before Max, like I just had Max a year ago, right? So... I think we had repaired our relationship uh, towards my late, tw my early twenties. It was a, just a, a disaster. I was still going through all my stuff. I had a lot of anim animosity towards uh, my parents because of everything that happened. And then it wasn't until like late twenties that I have like this complete, you know, paradigm shift of, you know what, like. I should be grateful for all that stuff that I think was so bad because it's really set me up for who I am today. Mm. 
And that that mental shift has really helped me uh, like get over a lot of the stuff that I think I was holding against her. And I think she's also had a lot more compassion and empathy for us because one of the things that's hard when you have a, a, a cycle like that with parents is as hard as I think my childhood was, my mom went through even more shit. Mm -hmm. So Plus she was a kid when she raised you guys. Right, and yeah. she was 20, right? So when I would be giving her shit in her 20s, she would, you know, instead of being sorry for it or explaining – she would like look, you know, treat me like you're a pussy. You should have seen what I went through. You know what I'm saying? And you do that yeah. to a 20 year old kid who's got a bunch of animosity built up. It just causes friction. Of course. Where I think that's come full circle for us, and it didn't happen until probably my late 20s, early 30s, where uh, I again felt very grateful for all the stuff that we went through. And then I think that she started to build a little bit of empathy, even for us, even though she knows that she had it harder. So, yeah, I think that we had built a better foundation. And then, then when Max came in, it's just like, and she's a great grandma. My mom just, she absolutely loves, I know some, I have friends that like watching their parents, their parents are almost weird with the kids. It's not every, not every grandparent like, uh, handles children really well. Or mm -hmm. like if you had like a, so for example, I have a buddy who has a dad and you, we didn't know this until he had his kid that realized how, uh, disconnected he was to raising the children. The mom handled it so much that, and we never thought that because we were kids. We he didn't, didn't know go, what to do. Yeah, and so then you see him with the grandkid, and he's like, yeah. you know, yeah, he's all nervous about I it. Think they pooped, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. Doesn't want to be left alone with the kid. And you're like, what the fuck? You raised me, didn't yeah. you? You know. So the guys are like tripping out about that. Where my mom is very hands on. Like my mom, you know, the fact that she did raise us, you know, when she was 20, you know, and she's had four kids. She's had a lot of practice, and so watching her with the grandkids, she's. She's great. It is it is interesting to see your parents as grandparents because they're just like my my, they're my different. My dad didn't my dad I've never seen him lose his temper with yeah. with yeah. his grandkids. Ever. Yeah. Oh, they're way more calm. Oh. Yeah. My it, mom's the same way. Like she was just I, I think we just stressed her the hell out, you know, <laughs> like all the time. <laughs> yeah. And yeah, so seeing her with my kids is like a completely different experience. Just like super chill, like happy, you know, mm -hmm. like that didn't happen a lot growing yeah, up. Yeah, but. I think my mom like like spanked like my 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 daughter's hand one time because yeah. she and my, and my daughter would like totally deserved worse. She did one of these, and my daughter was so shocked. And I looked at my daughter like, "You have no idea. <laughs> yeah. like, you have no idea." Yeah, that was the worst. Of that it. was a high heel twenty yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I would have forgot all the whole day. Is what happened Dude, so you got you guys actually celebrated Christmas. On yeah. Like an off day, and this has been a thing for you, yeah, for, for each year. Yeah, I actually just posted about that, right? So I shared that uh, with uh, my followers and stuff that we've, and we've been doing this now for a while. My mom, and, and I love that my mom did this, right? She finally just got so tired of, you know, fighting with the family over who's because you got we're all married, everybody has kids, everybody's got big families. That's a smart strategy. Yeah, there's divorce totally. and blended family with everybody, so it's like almost impossible to get a, a true holiday day with all of us. And if we do, it's a it's a window. It's like, oh, we'll all stop by mom's on Christmas day for this like four hour block. And then we have to go here and we have to go there where my mom's like, you know what? I don't give a shit about the date. You know, mm -hmm. let's just say, let's just pick a weekend that is, you know, probably one of the slowest weekends for all of you guys. Yeah. And I want, I'd rather have all my kids under one roof and we'll, we'll celebrate Tom's birthday and Larry's yeah. birthday and Adam's birthday. And you Katrina. guys hacked the system. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. um, and at first it was weird. Like, so I was like, not a fan of it when we first started doing it. It's like, this is weird. It's not Christmas. It's not my yeah. birthday. Like, why are we doing this now? I think now that I have a kid. And I see like the interaction with his cousins and then my sisters and my mom and everybody all together. I'm extremely grateful that she started to do that because we can all be together. You know, something you said I want to go back to because I think it's such an important <clears throat> thing to talk about is you said uh, in your late 20s, you started to be thankful for the tough things that you went through because yeah. it made you who you are. Such an empowering uh, switch of, I guess, a paradigm shift. It doesn't change anything that happened to you, mm -mm. but it changes the the way that you view it and it's very empowering. It's such an empowering um, message. I think a lot of people forget that because if you constantly view, you know, your past as shitty, um, and, it, and yes, shitty things happen, but really the way you view it, you can either choose to be empowered by it or you could choose to feel like a total victim by it. Totally different. No, it's always totally different. It's, every situation is all about how we frame it. And I believe that there's always a silver lining in every situation. So, but it took me a long time to believe that, mm -hmm. right? If, if, when you're a young kid and you don't know any better, you're, you're so selfish, insecure, you have so much of your own shit that 
you go through shit and then it's you, you know, oh my bad parents or oh bad situation, you blame the world. Um, as an adult, I look back and like for me it was like training ground. I go, you know, all the stuff that happens to you as you get older, because drama, shit will happen forever. And it happens to everybody and everybody's got mm -hmm. a story. And I realized that all those things that I had I had gone through had set me up to look at everything else that I go through as an adult as like nothing, like not a big deal. And so and now that I look at that, when people ask me, like, I had, that wasn't a big deal to you or that didn't bother you or wasn't it? Weren't you scared when this happened? And I was like, no, like, you want to hear a scary story? Let me tell you when I was eight, you know, or let me tell you when this happened or when that happened. Like, that was scary because I was a kid. And that started to, like, really change the way I looked at it that, wow, you know, had I not gone through all those things that I used to be so angry about, I, would, I wouldn't have been so resilient as, a, as an adult. Totally. And so once I started to look at it like that, I started to think like, man, I'm, I'm actually really happy and glad that I went through all that stuff. And that changed mm. our dynamic completely. Wait, wait a minute. I just figured something out. Is that why all the... We, didn't we have like a 48-pack of Z-Biotic up at the house? <laughs> yeah. It's gone. Is that because you guys crushed the whole thing? <laughs> so that was actually... Uh, wait, are all of them gone? Not all of them. So, And I'm replacing them, okay? What, is there like two left? Wow. No, no, there's there's a couple more than that. that uh, Three. But, that was because of Katrina's family. So mm -hmm. we had Katrina's family the the weekend or two weekends before that for Thanksgiving, right? So they came out there, and uh, we had just got that Z Biotic, the big old family the pack. special order. And when the family found out that we had it at the house, everybody wanted to try it out. And they like her family goes ham, dude. Yeah. I mean, they just she's she's definitely got it in the blood. Like, there's not a single family member. They have two livers each. Yeah, who doesn't drink? They all can lots of nog fluid. Mix their alcohol, party all night long, get back up the next day, run it back like it was no big deal. Like, so I just and so I introduced it to the the family, and once everybody and we were there for a whole week. So once they tried, like people tried it, they were like, oh. Holy shit, I feel amazing today. <laughs> and I did like 12 <laughs> drinks yesterday. Wait a minute, they drink more because of it? <laughs> oh, yeah. That's the bad part. I know. Uh, I do. That's what it does, right? Because it makes you, I mean, I have a yeah, limiter. You get super cocky about it. Yeah. yeah. It, when, when I, if, if I'm not, if I don't have Z Biotic around and I'm happen to have a drink or two, I shut it down like at two. I know. Like if I go any more than that, like I start getting four, five, six drinks and I don't have Z Biotic. I know I'm paying for it. I know 100% that I'm going to feel terrible the next day, and it'll be at least a day or two before I feel like my diet is back and like my training and everything's back. So I just say, hell, I'm not doing it unless I have that. Wow, <laughs> that's insane. Hey, yeah. uh, what do you guys think about the Jake Paul? Did you guys oh see that? Oh, my God. Yeah, so you watched that whole hype video that he was trying to put out there. Dude. Uh, it's I have, going to happen. I have to say this. The, the, With Connor? Yeah. He, he It'll is, happen. For sure. He is, uh, yeah. what, you know, whatever you think about him as a person or whatever, annoying, that's what... Brilliant, brilliant uh, social media. Well, that's why that's, he he proposed what five million out of his own no fifty, 50 million. Oh, 50. It is the it's the it's the largest yeah, offer of, for her fight ever. Of he, course, he's that, going to say yes. That's why it'll happen. He just bought himself a, a ticket. That's why it'll happen. Yeah. It will one hundred percent happen because of the money. Because he is offering him more money than anybody has ever offered to get him to fight. Plus, then you get the pay per view money on top of that, and he'll know that he'll yeah. know it'll be a bigger pay. He'll get a bigger payday fighting Jake Paul with that than he would than he did. Plus, for the, the way he presented himself so silly, and the way he talks shit about McGregor's wife. Uh, did you hear that part? Yes, I did. He's like, oh, she's a four. She's so, a four. Yeah. Oh, my God. Like, brilliant. Because, uh, he, you know, who knows how he is behind, you know, uh, off the camera. But that's going to make people want to watch. Because you either want to watch him get his ass kicked, which I think a lot of people are going to be like, oh, 100%. please kick his ass. Or you're going to watch because you want to. douchey sunglasses and his, like, stupid hair. Oh, <laughs> oh my man. God. I mean, <laughs> have you seen that guy? Yeah. Dude, God. smart though. Yeah. It's very, very I, smart. I 100% tell you guys, it will happen. Of course, $50 million. Yeah, will, You'd be stupid not to do it. And yeah. and then who was it? Was it Nate Diaz that was yeah. talking shit back to uh -huh. him? Fire him. Yeah. I mean, those guys are just, you know, it's hopefully he doesn't see him on the street because they just want to fight no matter what. Now, I, They'll you, do it for free. I mean, I guess when you're talking about the money that we're talking about, because my thing would be this, is like, once he does this, he's, he's done. Because once Connor or a real fighter fucking just wallop him manhandle no one's gonna give a shit about watching him box again yeah. until he actually goes to but who gives a shit if you cash out for a hundred and something million now well, do you, you think know, i'm so confused dude because didn't logan lose in his last fight and now he gets to fight mcgregor or not no, mcgregor no, no. Uh, you mean jake 
No, Logan, Logan is fighting Mayweather. Oh, Mayweather. Okay. Yeah. He oh, lost oh, his right. fight. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, did he lose his fight? He lost that fight. Yeah. Uh, I didn't, the I, one right before that. Oh, he did lose it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I, I, see, this I didn't is see. why I'm just like, whatever. They're just paying it, for you, you know their way to fight. Again. Well, they're just. They're, this is just a brilliant strategy. They're making money hand over fist. Yeah. And if you're a fighter, here's the deal. The fight game is, yeah, there's honor and all that stuff involved, but it's a business. But, and that's the bottom line. And if you're a fighter, even more so these days. Yeah, you're a fighter, and you get paid ten million to fight in the UFC. That's great, but someone's offering you fifty million, and you're like, well, "This guy's not even a." Did pro. you see? I sent yeah. you guys a screenshot of his story when he was showing the breakdown of what he sold for pay per views on his last fight. It was the eighth largest pay per view. Yeah. Wow. Eighth. It's yeah. just crazy. That yeah. is crazy. Some I, I, you know, you totally called it, Adam. You're yeah. you're you were 100 percent right. I know yeah. you called this before, and I I argued with you. How does I do that think make you feel I, right now hearing him say that? I know. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's like. Oh wow! Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. first that's, time that's ever. A moment. Yeah. 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 No, but you know, you know what though? Do you think that there's a limited shelf life on this? Like in, right now, it's a lot of novelty. <sighs> but... You know, you're. I don't know. I don't think so. Because here's the thing: just like what uh, anyone who sets it up like Jake did really well, it, because I think you're right that eighty to ninety percent of the people, including myself, would pay for that pay per view just because I want to see his ass get beat. So yeah. if you get a person who's got enough popularity and another person who's got enough popularity talking shit, it doesn't matter how much we speculate heading into it, how much you know this guy's going to win. Mm-hmm. Because if they did a good job of shit talking, you're watching it. it is, I mean, yeah. come on. People watch WWF all day long and it ain't real. I know yeah. I'm going to offend a bunch of fucking wrestlers out there. They, <laughs> yeah. it's, it's real. It's too real. Oh, no, no. <laughs> it's, it's scripted. No, but yeah, it, yeah, yeah. That doesn't yeah. mean it's- I mean, you get messed up. Yeah. 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 But yeah. you know what I mean, though. Yeah, like, it's, so, it's like a dance. I mean, we everybody who watches it knows that those guys technically don't hate each other mm-hmm. or any of that stuff. But we, we get into it and we still are entertained by it. So why is this any different? Yeah. You know- yeah. The, the only people I feel the worst about is this is are the real professional boxers. Of course, because you're you're getting brain damage. You're fighting for years. So, but you're this is and sharpening your skills. And then like, and, you know you make like five grand. And, question you know, is is this the natural evolution of the sport? Will this will this force fighters from now on like they will they they'll have to look at themselves as entertainers? Also, they were doing it before. Well, yeah, it just, no, it's, some were some, some were doing were. it. More really will well. probably do it. Now. Yeah, like so, like they, that'll be part yeah. of. Your training yeah. is like not only are you boxing and training and practicing, but then you also have got to do. Well, this. we were talking to Phil Deru about that. Remember, he was talking about like people that didn't get contracts in the UFC yep. because they just weren't entertaining enough. They didn't have any personality, yep. and it's like he's not going to sign. Even though you're like a really world class fighter, you know it's tough. Muhammad Ali was one of the first fighters to really put this together. I mean, he put on a show. Oh, yeah, everybody's would, modeled it. He after would him. make poems and, you know, and it was one way he got into people's, you know, uh, he got into their heads a little bit, but you wanted to watch so much cuz this cocky, loud fighter and you know, cuz before that boxing was per- it was very professional. You didn't really talk a lot of shit. Like yeah. you'd have these conferences, they'd sit down, they'd shake hands and it was a there was a different uh like honor code or whatever. Yeah. Now it's all, I mean, a lot of it's entertainment. Well, so. just think too from like a uh like how many did, uh, does Jake Paul have like what is followers? He's like fourteen million or something I like that. No, something, now, now is Jake? Something ridiculous. Jake is smaller than yeah. his brother, right? No, no, no. Jake is as big or bigger. Jake's the bigger guy. They're both big as fuck. Now is Jake? Is they're, J- they're both my size plus twenty pounds. On now me. who's they're the one big. that has yeah. the wrestling uh, background? I think it's Logan. Is it Logan? Yeah. Okay, because McGregor about McGregor's guys. not huge naturally. <laughs> he's not a big dude naturally. Right? Oh no, he's way small. Yeah, he so, fights at like one one seventy, and then he's and you're talking about a guy who walks around at two twenty. So he probably. McGregor probably walks around at 190 or something like that. So he'll be outweighed. If is it going to be MMA or is it going to be boxing? Oh, boxing. Box. Come on. Yeah. Oh. If it was even, MMA, it would have been. Dude. Yeah. Yeah, if yeah. it was yeah. MMA, I'm I'm definitely paying. Oh, for he'll that. just he'll just take him down and choke him out. Oh yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, I think he's going to outbox him. Chop too. his legs I really, right off. I, I really think he'll out. He's just he's more athletic. Bottom line, and I think it'll be he'll he'll. I mean, Gr- McGregor will kick his ass. Yeah. It's not even a matter. Of, but here's the thing. Look at this. We're sitting here debating that anyway. Exactly. And yes. the fact that we're having that conversation is there's you got to think what, what Jake Paul has got to have. Well, there's his breakdown. He's six one. How, what is it? Doesn't yeah, show it. his weight. I think he's like one seventy. No, sorry, one eighty nine or something like that. What? No, Maybe that's how he hits. Yeah, one eighty nine. Oh, oh, when he fought Robinson. Okay. Oh, so he no. Cut McGregor down. is five nine and weighs one seventy. Okay, so I was right so about six one and five nine. 
And this is boxing only. They're not that. He's one eighty nine. He does not look no one. He must have cut down for and for that fight. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, that's yeah. he looks way. Th- maybe then you're right. Then then that means Logan is probably quite a bit bigger than he is. Yeah. I thought Logan's two hundred pounds oh, fighting yeah. weight. Well, okay, so yeah. yeah, look, I they look like Jake looks bigger to me. I don't know why. Maybe he's just deconditioned more. Yeah. And Logan's in better shape. Well, six one and five nine boxing only. He's got a boxer's chance or a puncher's chance if he swings whatever. Does he have the skill? I mean, you're talking about world class. But then again, McGregor's not a world class boxer; he's a world class MMA fighter. Yeah. Um, but yeah. you see what they're setting the table for too, right? Did you see uh, Logan talking to uh, Shab? No. Yeah. So Brendan Shab interviewed and talked to Logan, and they they believe or what they're trying to set the table for is the two of them fighting each other. Mm. So right now they're off fighting, all, picking fights with all these people to get all this attention, make all this money. Then eventually the pay per view everyone will want to see is the brothers fight each other. <laughs> wow! And he and Logan really believes it'll be like the biggest event that's ever happened. Hey, do you guys remember? Uh, do you guys know who John Stossel is? Oh my god, I, I retire. Yeah. Do you guys, <laughs> do you know who John Stossel is Justin, the no. the, the reporter? No. Okay. Anyway. Oh wait, wait. Yeah, it depends. Like uh, if you could do an he was on, impersonation like, of him. Well, you'll, if you if Doug pulls him up, you'll see what I'm talking <laughs> yeah. about. He I, was. I hear, yeah, I want to hear the impersonation. He was a re- I don't know from impersonation. He was a reporter, one of the first reporters that uh, he reported on uh, pro wrestling being fake. So it's kind of known that it was fake. Uh-huh. But he was one of the first guys to be like, no, it's fake, and I'm going to go behind the scenes to prove it. And he went up to a – I don't remember the guy's name. It was, was a pro, it for a debate? No, it was a pro wrestler. That guy right there. You guys know who that is. He looks like a Geraldo. Uh, yeah. yeah. Kind of. Yeah. He went up to a pro wrestler. Great you got to pull this up when John Stossel confronts pro wrestler. He went up to a pro wrestler after uh, like well, a match. You guy body slam him. No, or dude. He goes, <laughs> he goes, pro wrestling's fake, right? It's fake. And the guy goes, is it fake? Is, it, is, it, is this fake? And bah! He fucking, slaps him. Yeah, that guy yeah. right there. Oh, there Blasts open. him on the floor and basically made him deaf and that, weird. That's a million dollar wow. man, isn't it? No, I've, that's some other guy. Oh, uh, uh, it is? Yeah, yeah see, they really hit each other. They slap the shit out of each oh, other. Oh, no, that guy goes, oh, is this fake? And he fucked him up. You guys yeah. never seen that video? Oh, no, it's great. I've it's, never seen it's, this. It's, it's pretty awesome. <laughs> Wrestling is fake. Watch this. Yeah. This is such a great... What year was this? Is this this a- was in the, I want to say... 80s or uh, no 80s. it was after that all of the 80s i think we believed it was real no uh, that's what i'm saying like there was still people would still argue as to whether or not it was real or not but stossel made this he did this whole like report to this guy <laughs> so he's he's confronting him right there and he goes yes. and he goes what? did you say did you say it's fake yeah he goes oh is, he goes is this fake watch, oh, yeah? watch yeah. what he does to yeah. it. it's fucked up bro. it's yeah. terrifying yeah. Watch yeah. This. your camera's fake yeah Oh, it's it's this is it's, it's so. Did he John, just flinch on him right there? Yeah. yeah. So John Stossel yeah. lost hearing in one of his he, ears. Lunged and, at him a little bit. And, no, he didn't. He did. Oh, how much did he? Oh, watch! Boom! He blasted. Him. Look at that on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't get watch. It's yeah. messed up, dude. Boom. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> how is this fake? Oh, oh my god, dude! How was... how much did he get sued for that? He had a lot. Get... Yeah, he, had he, he took him to court and got paid for a long time. I guess he had hearing damage and something else, like headaches that wow. lasted for years. Oh, my God, <laughs> dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't yeah. go up to a pro wrestler. and, and Hey, and yeah, did I you guys see uh, Shab did a uh, – okay, so Justin, you brought up, like, I don't know, this was a few months ago, this whole thing where you could, like, pay for celebrities to leave messages. What was that called? Oh, yeah. Cameo? Something? Cameo. Is it just called Cameo? It's just called Cameo. It's R- an app. And, it, so if, if, and correct. Correct me if I'm wrong. You, what you can do is I can pick, and it's I'm sure they're all priced differently. So the more famous somebody is, if I want The Rock to sing, happy, right. say Happy Birthday to my mom, I could pay some like weird, crazy yeah, number. Yeah, I mean, right? the, you you search for the celebrity you want, like what, like from D to, to A, whatever, like whichever ones are actually like on that platform, you can pay for them to to do. Yeah, like sing Happy Birthday or like have a private like a message that's like you know like one to two minutes long, something like that. So. Uh, Brendan Schaub posted a Bruce Buffer one. This dude uh, broke up with he paid they broke up with his girlfriend with Bruce Buffer. Oh my god! <laughs> so Bruce Buffer did his whole like in the ring like the announcement thing, and yeah. it was it's just like time! it's time, time for you to hit Katie the road to get out of here. <laughs> wow! Dude. Could you imagine being someone fucking in a relationship uh, and you get that message? Oh, oh my dick! God. Hey, did you guys see that? This is kind of a big deal. Um, I think it was Visa and Mastercard have. Pulled. Uh, I send that to you from yeah. Pornhub, and you were like, "Who pays for porn?" I that's said, "Obviously, a lot of people." That's pay also for- true. Yeah. Yeah. So How that- it was like a New York Times. They were doing an investigative, uh, I don't know, piece on, on it or whatever. And 
I, I forget how it got exposed. And then like, uh, basically because like anybody could post on there and they weren't like, uh, screening them properly. There was like child abuse, all the stuff that was getting like uploaded. And so that's kind of what started all this. Yeah. So apparently there was like, you know, <clears throat> people whose videos were getting uploaded without their permission or whatever. And because it's, you know, kind of like YouTube or you upload and they don't have enough people to check every single, I don't know how many videos get uploaded to Pornhub every single day, but it's an incredible amount. Quadzillion. And so there's this investigation going. So Visa and MasterCard pulled uh, from Pornhub and now yeah. they're doing this whole thing. And now they're only, I, I thought I read that they're only allowing like verified accounts to even post on it. So yeah. that's what they're doing now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I, I, hey, I agree with this, man. I think that there needs yeah. to be some, stricter regulation with this kind of stuff because uh, imagine I remember reading the story of this girl who had this really she she had sex with these guys but it was necessarily wasn't necessarily something she consented to and it got uploaded and then once it's up there you know, people could rip it, and it's out there. Now, how, did, how does never... how does a free market guy like you make peace with uh, decisions like that, right? So you're really like super pro free market. Let the market decide and 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 figure it out. This is part of it. Here's a situation where you know you you would want regulation to be in there. Like, how do you how do you make peace with that with somebody who is so well, pro free market? So I'm not a again, I'm not an anarchist, right? So I do believe in the court system. I do believe in in in, in laws, and I think. Suing them and the court system is part of the checks and balances. And I know that they've gotten sued. Now we have an investigation going in mm -hmm. and they're changing. You got to remember that, th that the wide use of pornography or mainstream is relatively new. And it takes a few decades before things really start to kind of shape up or whatever. Mm -hmm. This is part of it, in, in my opinion. Speaking of which, isn't there this show called uh, Middlemen? Was it you, Doug, that was bringing this up? Yeah, I actually watched this? it. It's pretty interesting. It's about the porn industry and how this guy basically, or these two guys figured out how to uh, take online payments. At that time, nobody was doing it. And not even Visa or MasterCard. So they, they made a fortune. Yeah, so I, is is middleman like a really leads the like way. a really nice way of like say a digital pimp? Kind of, I guess you'd say. Yeah, yeah, that's what it sounds <laughs> so like. So I, so I like read a digital pimp, right? You yeah. just it's, how's that? How funny is that that you could get away with it on online, but then if you were to be doing well, that on the, the streets, it's not okay. It's, it's a porn industry, so it's not actually prostitution. Yeah, yeah, right. But so, kind of. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You can't pay true. me for sex unless yeah, we film yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You yeah. could dress it up. Oh, well, that's true. Then but it's totally fine. We're yeah. actors. I, I, um, so I read that and I read some other articles. So um, very interesting. I didn't know this. So the VCR industry, uh, people think that the VCR industry would never have taken off the way it did if it wasn't for pornography. Because remember at that time, there was no real like rental industry. It wasn't a big deal. But porn was a big deal because now you could take a video and watch it in the privacy of your own home. And they think that's one of the initial reasons why VCRs So if that's exploded. true, wouldn't that mean that the original like movie rental stores that used to go to as a kid probably started as adults first and then they started to expand into other it areas? It gave them the foothold is what they're saying, right? That's mm. what kind of gave them that initial boost. And then they said it's no coincidence that the, the porn convention in Vegas happens literally across the hallway. Right next to CES. CES, the, yeah. the, the tech, uh, you know, like tech industries convention. Well, explain, they say the, because, explain the logic of that. Because the porn industry has driven so much advancements in entertainment tech and taking payments and that kind of stuff, yeah. streaming video, like that it, they, they kind of go hand in hand. Yeah. Very interesting. That Steal, is stealing all of your data. Well, that makes me, like I'm saying, so I, I don't quite remember it was before me. So I'm assuming it was like in the seventies when those made Doug, maybe you can school us here. So <laughs> why, why would I, well, know? When, when I was, when I was a kid, uh, you know, before even blockbuster, you know, you had all these like Ray's video, you know, and yeah. Mike's video. I went to photo drive up a uh, 24 hour photo drive up. Yeah. You know, you had, you had these, uh, <laughs> these small mom, pa movie rentals. Rentals. They all had what Justin talks about with the beads in the back, and you have to go through, and there's all the adult films. The Room of Shame. If, yeah. if what Sal is saying is true, then I would assume that Ray's video was originally all porn and then eventually moved into you know drama and, and horror and all the other genres. Yeah. Do you remember mm. like if, if they were primarily like porn rental places? I can't speak to that. I know a lot of places came up and they had all types of movies and they had that, that room in the back, but I, I can't say if somebody started out in porn and then, you know, branched out into other things. Mm. Well, wouldn't so, that, I mean, to me, that would, that would prove your theory. 
yes. either right or wrong. Well, so this was in an article that I was reading, and yeah. it was because yeah, everything online is always these, true. Yeah, well, these were historians that talk about tech and advancements, and they also talk about why Betamax got their asses kicked because the porn industry did not typically put pornography on beta; mm. it was VCR. So if you if you're gonna if you're a dad and you can remember at one point is that what happened with HD DVD versus the uh, Blu-ray? Blu-ray? Remember that battle? Who accepted porn first? Yeah. Well, they, think they, about they, it. You're, which, you're, one, which one made it? Think about it. You're a dad. You're gonna go buy like an expensive piece of technology, this new thing that you can watch videos. And your at porn home. doesn't. And play you're on like it. Betamax versus VCR. Which one's better? Like, oh wait, this one. Uh, let me get this one. One plays my adult, yeah, the other yeah. one doesn't. This one lets me watch. <laughs> Debbie does Dallas. Oh my and, goodness! And the other ones don't. There's I know. A theory. I know. Crazy. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to do a little uh, sharp turn here. I was doing some research on uh, treatments for COVID. I did not know this at all. You guys want to hear some crazy shit? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So there were some initial. And there's more studies going on right now. So COVID, a lot of uh, doctors and researchers are saying is a blood vessel uh, disease or a vascular disease. It causes the blood to clot quite a bit. In fact, when they do autopsies of people who die from COVID. I think something like around 70% of the people, they find blood clots in different parts of the body, legs, the lungs, all over the place. Mm. And it's one of the reasons why people with comorbidities like diabetes uh, is such a higher risk of death is because you already have issues with blood clots and stroke and stuff with those comorbidities. So anyway, there was this one study where they were giving patients aspirin. Aspirin has been around for 100 years. Yeah. It's yeah. one of the oldest medicines around. We know what it does, what it doesn't do. Relatively safe, and we know it's a very powerful anticoagulant substance, mm-hmm. right? It thins the blood. In fact, they give right. it to, they'll give you like a low dose of it if you've had a heart attack already or, uh, already, or if you have a stint, right? They'll take, take a lot this of people take it just preventatively. Right? Exactly. So they did this study, and they're doing more studies. Uh, it, it led to a 44% reduction in severe COVID symptoms. With just people. by taking aspirin? Aspirin. No shit. Simple Such as that. Cheap, wow. simple, whatever. So, so it was, I'll, I'll look up the statistics, and they're doing more studies on this. I'm like, why isn't this more, like, why don't we know? 44% less likely to be put on a ventilator <laughs> and 43% less likely to be admitted to the inv- intensive care Unit. Wow, that's it, interesting. Isn't that crazy? Did you guys see the the basketball player, the college kid who collapsed? What yeah, was that? I did see that. So what happened to him? Well, I think he's in a coma right now, uh, and they 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 don't know why yet. But I know that he also had COVID earlier in the year, though. So of course it's getting all kinds of attention right now that it, and then when you're the talking is somehow he just related fell. to that. He just fell. Oh yeah. I mean he collapsed on his face. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I think he was out before he hit the ground, right? Yeah. I mean the way he fell. Look at Doug, look up this video so these guys can see this. The uh college kid collapses on court. He was from It was actually in our text group. Uh, yeah, Doug. I sent it I sent it over to you guys. Um I forget what school it was off the top of my head. Um it was like Syracuse or something. Mm. Uh, I don't remember. But it was super scary, right? Oh they oh it was Florida. Oh, Florida. Yeah, look, he just boom. On his stomach. On his face, bro. He went face first. That's crazy when you see a young athlete do that. Although, remember, I've heard of cases where young athletes just suddenly die, um, you know, while they're playing the sport or whatever. Yeah. Uh, And I I remember talking to, I used to train a a vascular surgeon, cardiovascular surgeon, and he said that um, that there's a slightly higher risk of, uh, what is it, uh, where the heart stops um, with uh, with athletes than there are with normal young people. Because they're people. constantly pushing the Maybe. Rev- yeah, I would Maybe. imagine that, right? Yeah, but he's not dead, though, right? He, this guy's got Well, he's in a coma right now, so he's not doing well at right. all, but I don't know. So this led me down a rabbit hole, right, of this, like, like okay, blood thinning is a, a, a viable potential mm-hmm. way of preventing yourself from having severe complications from COVID. I looked up fish oil. Uh, cod liver oil. These are all things that can, you know, thin the blood. Mm-hmm. And there are fish oil does that. Fish oil for sure. I didn't know that. Oh yeah, it's I didn't know that. lowering inflammation. And uh, I knew that. Okay, so if is that why it lowers inflammation? Because it thins the blood. That's one way. No, not necessarily. There's, there's a couple different actions. But let's say you're going to go. Uh, let's say you're going to go get surgery. Yeah. If and they ask you what supplements are you taking, and you say, "Oh, I take fish oil," they'll tell you. Stop taking fish oil a couple of weeks before. No surgery. shit. Yes, I did not know that. Yeah, so I looked it up and I'm like, okay, well, what about fish oil? Is this because aspirin very powerful? But what do I take every day? I don't want to take aspirin every day. Right. So what, what else can I possibly do? And right now there are, I believe, three or four uh, pharmaceutical trials going on with omega three based uh, therapies for oh nice uh, for for COVID. 
I'm glad a lot of these preventative uh, methods are starting to come through and emerge, like the information for that. I just feel like that's been buried through this whole process. It's been frustrating. Who, totally. ma- who makes aspirin? Bayer's? Or who, who's oh, it? and it's who, generic now. Is it? So anybody makes it? Anybody who's who's makes the biggest it. producer of aspirin? I'm thinking it's Bayer was the original. Bayer, stock, stock wise. Yeah. What do we, who, is it Bayer, you think? Oh, there's no yeah. stock. Well, dude, I, I heard generic, a crazy gonna... thing too with the, with the whole COVID. Like, I heard that. Uh, so you know those dogs that uh, they train to sniff things at the airport, and, and yeah. Uh, so th- they've actually trained dogs to be able to sniff cancer, and and you know, and they've been able to to identify also like we brought this up years infectious ago, I think, right? bacteria and things like that. And so they're actually uh, a lot of scientists that are handle uh, you know that are are actually trying to to get them to smell COVID. Wow. Yeah. Oh, but I don't think it's, I don't think they've had any success with it yet, but I, I know that that's been a thing that they've been experimenting with, which you is interesting. That, you hear that, Mozzie? Yeah. yeah. He's out. Yeah, he's he don't give a shit. I think yeah, he could do it. Dog, it uh, what a weird world. If you're a dog, what a weird experience. You, you smell everything so powerfully. That must yeah. be weird. Yeah, that's crazy. It's probably yeah. awful. <laughs> yeah, smell, <laughs> smell your bad mood. Sal, you were, you, uh, before we got on air, you were talking about, uh, you just listened to a really good episode with oh. Bishop Barron. Finish your sentence. I didn't uh, okay. want to hear more about so, it. So, Word on Fire is a podcast that uh, where Bishop Barron, um, you know, he's he's on there. He talks, he interviews people sometimes, but usually it's just him. And it's a spiritual, um, religious based podcast. But the thing I like about Bishop Barron is he'll he'll talk uh, very objectively, logically, and it's very applicable. Whether you're religious or not, I think there's a lot of value. Anyway, he did an episode with uh, Ruben, who is a gay liberal atheist, right? He's a he's a he's an atheist. He's yeah, gay, married to a man, um, and they were both on the podcast. And the title of it was "Has Liber- Liberalism Failed?" It was an excellent, excellent podcast. There's two episodes, very objective, two very very smart guys. But one thing on there that they talked about was the fatherless epidemic, right? So statistically speaking, um, among all families, and you and de- depending on if you're looking at you know different uh, types of people, it's higher or lower. But generally speaking, 33% of children in America are without a father. So that's one third mm. wow. of all kids, right? And so they asked them if this has an impact and what the deal is. So Bishop Barron brought something up very interesting. Well, wait, let me stop you before you keep going. When when you hear read a stat like that, do you go deep? Like one third of the population is ridiculous. And what constitutes fatherless? Does that mean just not in the home, but he's still a he's still around or divorced? Like how, how what is fatherless? Not involved at all. Yeah. So he's not seeing him on the weekends even right. or anything at all. That's considered so right. Thirty percent don't even see that, and then what? I wonder what percentage are doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's crazy. Yeah, so that's a lot, and that sucks, right? And there's some real. Uh, I mean, we can see this clearly. Statistics will show that there's specific values that a, a male role model will bring versus a female role model, and what ends up happening. Here's mm-hmm. an interesting one that I was because then the then the discussion. Uh, let me let me preface this. The discussion went into the direction of worship. And psychologically speaking, and this is just a fact, this is just a fact with humans, so just how we're made, um, we, because we make decisions based off of values, every decision you make is based off of values. Sure. So if I, I put on the shirt today because I liked it better than my other shirts, I eat what I eat because I like it more than everything we make is based off values. And so at the end of that, uh, at, the, at the end of the day, there's something that's my top value and whatever that is, is what I end up worshiping. And so they talk about that, how people, whether they realize it or not, we have to worship something. So Bishop Barron makes the argument that uh, worshiping the infinite uh, is most important, is the best thing to do, worship a God. Because when you worship money or power or politicians or government, lots of big problems happen. So the argument was, you know, do democracies need to have religion in order to survive? Because without religion, then people start, and the argument was, they start to worship Power, power, and money, government, and yeah. stuff like mm-hmm. that. But here's an interesting statistic. I didn't know this. Bishop Barron said that um, when fathers stop going to church, that's when the family stop going to church. It's the fathers that dictate uh, the the what the the practices mm-hmm. of the children mm-hmm. going to church. Mothers not nearly as impactful in that regard. Hmm. So it's like if mom goes but dad doesn't go, kids probably aren't gonna are probably not going to go. It's oh, about interesting. interesting. Yeah. Isn't that interesting? That is interesting. Very interesting statistic. Wow. I, I like I like looking at the differences between- Was that know, on his regular podcast? That it did? was. It was. Really, really good. There's two episodes. I highly recommend. Did you listen to both? I've, I'm halfway through the second one. I'm just enthralled. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. First question is from Little Blue Arrow. Is there an ideal rest period between sets? I'm sure it's subjective, but are there body cues I should be listening to 
that can help me determine an appropriate rest? Yeah, I'm. You know, I picked this question because um, I think a lot of people get confused about rest periods, and they don't realize just how important yeah. it is, it, rest periods are to the effectiveness uh, of in a term, workout. In terms of like the adaptation process well, in it's general. An, it's too. another progressive overload tool, and we know that that's one of the best ways to guarantee that you keep seeing progress. Yeah. It is, and not only that, but if you rest, if you change your rest periods, you change the effect of the workout completely. Yeah. I could take a straight set, structured uh, routine with compound barbell lifts, do all that stuff, and then eliminate rest periods, and it doesn't matter. It now has turned into yeah. uh, circuit training and cardio. So mm. rest periods are very important. If you're lifting weights, your goal probably is to speed up your metabolism, sculpt your body, get stronger, in which case you want to rest long enough to allow your body to replenish its ATP, which is a, a, the type of energy you use for, for strength. So you want to, in other words, you want to rest long enough to where you could go back to your set and feel strong again. You don't want to j just barely catch your breath and jump back in unless your goal is endurance. If your goal is endurance and stamina, then you can do that. In which case I would say don't lift weights, go do, uh, you know, sprints or cardio to do that. Well, it's very similar to like uh, sets and reps, right? Where there's, I think there's two ends of the spectrum. So if we look at rest periods, I would say. 30 second rest is on the low end of the spectrum. Three minute rest is on the high end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. Anything below that or above that, and you start you start to lose some of the benefits of yeah. resistance training. So first of all, those are the parameters that I would stay within. I would, uh, and the further you are on the spectrum, the the least amount of time I would spend training that way. In other words, uh, I would I wouldn't always train uh, 30 second rest periods because then you're gonna get close. You're gonna get more adaptation towards the endurance side, like mm -hmm. Sal was saying. Mm -hmm. I don't want to uh, rest more than three. Three minutes all the time because then I'm getting less benefits from the resistance training. So I want to manipulate my rest periods within that kind of window. And the same rules apply to that we talk about with reps is if you've been training in the 15 rep range for weeks on weeks or months on months, one of the best things you could do is move out of that rep range to send a new signal to the body to adapt and change because it's different. The same thing goes for rest periods. If you've been you know, hanging around the one minute rest periods and you're consistent with that and you've been doing that for weeks on weeks, one of the best things you do is move to three minutes. Mm. And if you're like, you lift like kind of like a strength athlete, power athlete, then you are probably already resting a long time, three minutes or more maybe. Then the, one of the best things you could do is move down to the 30 second to one minute and you're going to see results from that. Yeah, I w it's interesting because I, I spent uh, some time in this gym. There was this guy that was a gymnast who was always like doing ring work. And because it's so physically demanding, your entire body is just like on fire the whole, the whole time. Everything's tensed up. Uh, it, it requires so much exertion that uh, his rest periods were, were really long. Uh, yeah. in between and I'd and I'd ask him about that but it really to be able to even perform a lot of these these movements and things with that type of demand and intensity uh, he had to string out his rest periods at like a, a really uh, you know a, an excessive amount of time more than the normal which I mean it made sense but it's all like very specific to how you're training he was training technique he was trying to get his technique perfect and fatigue screws that up I'll That's tell it. you I'll tell you where people mess up the most with rest is when they train for power. When I see people do jump boxes or plyometric throws or whatever in gyms, yeah, the short they, rest periods. They totally screw it up the no rest. Sense. They treat it like cardio. So it's like, you know, one to another, to another, get tired as possible. You're not getting any power uh, yeah. benefit out of that. Well, you could just do that. I mean, you could just jump in place. Exactly. And, and, yeah. And like save yourself all the knee uh, gouging. Exactly. So if you're going to train for power, Long rest periods. You know, you're resting until you feel like you're fresh, and then you do it again, and that's how you improve your explosive ability. One of the best advices, though, re regarding this is actually just telling somebody to start tracking, right? Like a lot of I, very few people I know time their rest periods. Uh, most people go by feel. Yeah, you know, they they do this, they do a set, and then they go, oh, okay, I feel like I'm ready for the next one. And one of the coolest things that you can do to change up your routine without even messing with any exercises, sets, or anything is literally just track the time and see what you consistently rest for, and then manipulate that. Mm -hmm. So, and yeah, because depending on the person, they're going to rest somewhere, like I said, somewhere between that thirty second and three minute mark. 
And I normally like to go the opposite end of whatever spectrum or whatever side of the spectrum I lean on. So if I'm a long rester and I'm resting at least a minute and a half to three minutes, then I like cutting that way down to three, 30 seconds to a minute to shock my body the most. And if I'm somebody who's on the other side where I love to do circuit training, I get bored resting in between sets, I feel like I can always do more. If I'm always leaning towards that, I'm going to push that person towards the three minute mark. Mm. Next question is from Brookie the Ginger. Do you recommend starter or anywhere for after pregnancy if I was doing anabolic and teaching cycling classes before? No way do I have home equipment for anabolic. Okay. So um, this this is a great question because um, I think especially if you're fit going into pregnancy and you exercise during pregnancy and then afterwards there's a six-week – Usually it's around six weeks. Some women wait as long as eight weeks or nine weeks before they start exercising. They totally uh, really underestimate just how deconditioned your body gets mm -hmm. uh, when you take that break. I mean, it's been, I'm doing this with Jessica right now. So she literally had her first workout yesterday after she had uh, the baby. And now she also had a C-section, so that adds another element. But um, her core stability is gone, right? There's no, like, no connection. And she was tripping over this. Yeah. She's like, I can't activate these muscles oh, anymore. That's the biggest hurdle initially to, to, to overcome. Totally. And I told her, I said, it's going to come back because of muscle memory, um, but let's take it very slow. So that's number one. Number one is don't underestimate just how deconditioned you are after take, having that break, especially if you have something like a C-section. Go very, very slow. Start slow. And then if you were in shape before, your body will start to progress relatively rapidly, but <laughs> start safer than you think is my recommendation. As far as programs are concerned, MAP Starter is ideal. It's a perfect program for uh, for post uh, postnatal. Perfect. We've been getting a lot of questions around this. Do you know? And I know you are heading this up as far as content wise. Do you know where we're at with the postpartum uh, pillar page? I believe it should. I've be, seen I've seen it done. Yeah, I think it should be up soon. I, I know it's complete if it's not already. Yeah, up. Right yeah, now. yeah. Mm -hmm. Katrina was showing me the the actual page. It looks phenomenal. So the, I, I, I've been telling people this that have been DMing me that in regards to this, they've been asking, "Oh, you guys got to come out with something or create a program or." You know, want they want more information? Like we just like the macro calculator and the the skinny guy uh, pillar page. We've built this massive pillar page, which is just loaded full of I don't know how many you I don't know if you know how many blogs and videos. I think it was like twelve or fifteen or something. Yeah, like that no, attached to it. Yeah, videos. it's even more than that. There's a ton. I think it's more like fifty that's attached to to that pillar page, mm -hmm. and there's videos and so a ton of free information. Uh, regarding all of this is coming really soon for you guys. Yeah, totally. And now with Map Starter, for those of you that don't have that, oh, the reason why it's so valuable for post, uh, you know, post pregnancy or postnatal, um, it, it uses a lot of the stability ball, and the stability ball is so valuable when you've lost connection to your core, you've lost balance and stability. You don't even realize it. Um, I would recommend doing a lot of exercise on that, going very light, focusing on full range of motion. But the physio ball forces you to try to activate, to stay tall, and to stabilize. If you don't do that and you jump yeah. into weights, uh, injury is uh, is there. It's right around the corner, so be very careful. Next question is from Anita Rosales90. What exercise would you recommend to alleviate knee pain? we got to figure out what the knee pain is yeah, from first, right? Well, so got to trace that back. Yeah, now generally speaking, in your guys' experience, when someone has chronic knee pain... IT related normally? It, yeah, it's coming from the hips or the ankles or the feet. Nine out of ten times, the knee is moving in a way that is not ideal, and it has been for a long time, because... Your ankles, your feet, or your hips are not doing what they're supposed to. Because if you look at the knee, it really it, it, it flexes like and extends. Joint. Yeah, it, it bends. It bends and it, and it, it doesn't rotate. It doesn't bend laterally. It just flexes and extends. But your ankle can move in all kinds of different directions. Your foot moves in a lot of different directions, and your hips move in a lot of yeah, different yeah. directions. And if they lack strength and stability, the knee is what takes that pressure. And so, in my experience, when I've had clients with chronic knee pain, when I fix their hips and their ankles. I mean, uh, it's like 70% of the time I can get rid of almost all the knee pain from doing that. I was like, so I, this is what really introduced me to foam rolling. I used to foam roll like crazy because of my, my knee pain in my hip and I'd get it a lot from playing, like I played basketball and I'd have just excruciating knee and hip pain and not, like the foam rolling would relieve that. Like, so it felt amazing to foam roll. It would give me relief. 
Then I got smart about it and said, okay, I need to do this before I play ball. And so that would loosen it up. But then it would just keep happening. So it, I wasn't fixing the root cause. I was just kind of putting a Band-Aid over. At least the foam rolling was at least alleviating it, letting me do that. Um, and I just assumed that it had something to do with my hip. You know, it was always, I, I figured hip, it wasn't until I met Brink did I realize that it actually stemmed all the way from my foot. Mm. So because my foot was was excessively pronating on the left side more than my right side, when you when that does that, so when the, the foot, you know, collapses inward, that also internally rotates the, the femur. So it winds that IT band. So the IT band is extremely tight and then it's pulling on the hip and then it's pulling on on the patella, the knee, right? So that would cause that. And so even though I'd foam roll, it would kind of make it relax and loosen it up. I'd feel good. Mm-hmm. As soon as Temporary I go, so, yeah, exactly. As soon as I go play ball and I'm moving around, my foot's still pronate and collapse. And I don't see that because I'm playing. You're not paying attention to it. But because I'm pushing off like that all day long, it's just tightening up on mm-hmm. that IT. And then I would just keep, I was in this loop. It wasn't until, and I don't have this at all anymore, right? So this is, a lot of this was related to the low back pain I talk about, the hip pain I had. All of this was all stemming from the foot. As soon as I- You're gone. You fixed yeah, it all. Gone. I haven't had I haven't had to foam roll my IT in years now, and it was all because of the foot. It was stemming from that, and it was causing the knee and the hip pain. Once I addressed my my foot strength, my ankle mobility, uh, that completely changed. Next question is from Elijah Liu. In a recent podcast, Adam mentioned getting burnt out as a trainer, in part due to the generally low success rate in helping clients reach their goals. So how do you measure your success as a trainer then? What metrics do you use to know you're doing a good job? Boy, this this changed a lot through the years. Initially, I thought success meant uh, getting my clients to the goals. Oh, you want to lose 20 pounds? We got you to lose 20 pounds. I succeeded. Uh, I also thought it was related to how many clients hired me. I got all these clients hiring me, and I'm getting people to their goals. I'm a very successful trainer. It wasn't until later when I, you know, just after years of doing this, maybe five years later, I look back and I'm like, man, yeah, I got people to lose 20 pounds. How many people kept it off? You know, how many people uh, achieve, developed a lifelong relationship with exercise and nutrition? And it was almost none. It's like, if they didn't hire me and they weren't working with me, they didn't work out. They had to be with me all the time. I thought, this can't be right. Like, yeah. you shouldn't have to work with a trainer for the rest of your life. There's nothing wrong with doing well, that. Well, that but- was part of the business model. Yep. I mean, it, unfortunately, you want your clients to continually come back to see you. And so this is actually kind of a tough one to to relieve yourself and, and realize that you're trying to prepare them to be able to do this themselves and, and let them continue on the journey and learn everything they can. But uh, you, you know, it took me a while to shift into that because it was such a part of the business model I was running it was like, you're coming in this many times and I'm going to handle everything uh, to where I'm just going to, I started to shift it over and start teaching them all of, of the techniques and all of the why behind we're, what we were doing and how they could apply this best uh, within their life. Lifestyle, and it's really just keying into their lifestyle and seeing how they can just tweak and turn certain things to be able to keep them going long term. The truth for me is that I attached my success as a trainer to money, to uh, how much money I was making, how much my schedule was booked, and the company I worked for at the time trained me that way. I got, I got, I didn't get rewarded for changing some client's life or losing them 30 pounds. How many sessions you yeah, sold? If I sold a lot of training sessions and my schedule was booked and I was doing more hours than anybody else, I was the best. So I, that's how I was trained early on was that if I was loaded, my schedule was loaded and I couldn't fit any clients in, I, I must be kicking ass. But the reality of that was, and, I, and I, that's why I shared that in that episode, I remember looking at all these glass trophies that said I was so great and then I started going back through my client folders and going, well, I wonder where that person is. I've never, I haven't seen them again. I haven't seen this person. I haven't seen that person. And these people that I was supposedly helping, you know, even though I might have helped them while they were paying me, when they left, I never saw them again. They weren't training in the gym. Mm-hmm. I, they weren't, they weren't in great shape. Sure, I had some, but it was a very small percentage considering how many people that I was that were I was working with. So it wasn't until later in my career, and 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 it's hard because. If you're if you're making money and you're and you're booking your schedule all the time, then you feel like oh I must be doing a really good job and I'm happy and I need to have, make a livelihood so everything's all good, and I really thought that that was the model was if I did such a good job while they were with me, they would almost be afraid to do it on their own so that would keep them coming yeah. back or keep them longer in my in my books, and so that was success. But 
And I was afraid to really make that switch to not worrying about that and really, really worrying on helping them and changing their lives. What I found, though, was when I stopped caring so much about about the money aspect and filling my book and really like diving into how can I be a better trainer and get my clients to, to learn these behaviors and actually go off on their own and teach others or continue doing it themselves. Once I made that switch, it actually became even easier to keep my schedule filled. Isn't so, that funny? Mm -hmm. Yeah, because early it was a hustle, right? It was like I was always selling. I was always going after people and trying to get people in my schedule, and I was good at it, at, at convincing people to train with me, and they enjoyed it while they were with me, but it was a constant hustle. Once I shift my focus on really trying to change behaviors in these people's lives, give them the tools to go on without me, and I and, and that became my desired outcome. Like initially, initially it was never my desired outcome. My desired outcome when I got a client was convince this person they never want to leave me. Convince this person mm -hmm. that I am as valuable as their car payment, their PG&E bill, and all these other things that they pay for in their life. Now you have the Adam bill, and I'm worth it, right? So that was like the the desired outcome. My desired outcome later on began, how much can I help this person in the shortest amount of time to give them the tools to go on for the rest of their life without ever needing me? When I shift that focus that way, mm -hmm. then the referral base of people that mm -hmm. I would start to get, I wouldn't have to solicit anymore. I didn't have to go get. People would come, would be constantly talking about Well, what about you it. realize is there's a whole lot to cover. Yeah. You know, like it, it takes a long time. It takes a long time. And so to to try and think that, oh, I need to keep their attention. I need to keep uh, them coming back and them paying me. It's like if you just turn and shift your mind to I, I'm going to really try and, you know, teach them this one thing, you know, in this session and then just kind of build upon that. It's just it, it almost seems endless. Uh, the amount of information and, and techniques and things that you could pass on it, to this person. The irony is doing it that way. You're, you're far more successful, just like yeah. you said, Adam. I, yeah. I, they get I way more value out of it. Way more value. It does take. You're more of you're more of a guide uh, than a than a uh, like a drill. I look sergeant. at myself as an oracle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, you're you're what you're doing is you're you're guiding them to be able to figure these things out and do them on their own. And it does take a lot of time. And it, it, this is what it ended up looking like in my business. It ended up looking like this when I started to figure this out and I really started to get good. A client would hire me, and initially they'd meet with me two or three days a week, and then I'd train them for a while, and then I'd meet with them two days a week. And then I train them for a while. Then they'd meet with me once a week. And eventually I'd get a client uh, to work with me once a month. And then my schedule filled up with people who would see me once a week, once every other week or once a month. And I had all these clients that did that. And then they would come in or do stuff on their own in between. And it was literally just to come see me at the beginning of the month. What have you been doing? Let me change your routine. You have some pain. Let me show you some correctional exercise. And then I had this base of clients that was definitely permanent and the referrals were insane mm -hmm. from doing it this way. Yeah. And it sounds counter because you think, oh, if I teach them to do it on their own, they're going to leave me and I'm not going to have any clients. It doesn't work that way. Do a phenomenal job and you'll build your business even more. And now this, I mean, when I look back now at the last batch of clients that I trained, uh, every single one of them is still doing uh, what they what they deal with me. Every single one of them is consistent. And that's what I really truly consider, you know, consider success now. Look, Mind Pump is recorded on video as well as audio. Come find us on YouTube, Mind Pump Podcast. You can also find us all on Instagram. You can find Justin at Mind Pump Justin, me at Mind Pump Sal, Adam at Mind Pump Adam, and Doug at Mind Pump Doug. Being distracted by things all the time uh, is actually a stress on mm -hmm. the body. And you're right. You, you can feel it inherently. Like if, if you're listening right now and you've sat down and watched you know shows all day long and then it's over – you know, you feel it. You yeah. feel physically like it was a stress uh, on you. You're you're stimulated visually. You're watching something. 